Welcome back, everyone. This is the final session of the fourth weekend of the MBE Crash Course, and we're going to do evidence questions together as a group. Uh, we actually did five evidence questions at the end of class this morning. I know Grace was doing evidence questions on her break, and uh, we're going to do evidence questions right now. So let's uh, let me share my screen and we'll jump right into it. Let's do 25 evidence questions. Um, no purpose to really skip this one. I'll read the first one, then we can kind of move around the room and, you know, just figure out what we like to do today. So is the affidavit properly considered by the court in enrolling on the admissibility of the pedestrian statement? A pedestrian died from injuries caused when a driver's car struck him. The pedestrian's executor sued the driver for wrongful death. Sorry, the pedestrian's executor sued the driver for wrongful death. At trial, the executor calls a nurse to testify that two days after the accident, the pedestrian said to the nurse, the car that hit me ran the red light. 15 minutes thereafter, the pedestrian died. As a foundation for introducing evidence of the pedestrian statement, the executor offers to the court the doctor's affidavit that the doctor was the intern on the duty the day of the pedestrian's death, and that several times that day, the pedestrian had said that he knew he was about to die. Is the affidavit properly considered by the court in ruling on the admissibility of the pedestrian statement? No, because it's hearsay without hearsay now within any exception. No, because it's irrelevant since dying declarations can be used can be used in prosecution for homicide. Can only be used in prosecution for homicide. I'm sorry. Yes, because though hearsay is a statement of a then existing mental condition. Yes, because the judge may consider hearsay in ruling on preliminary questions. Interesting question. Anyone have any thoughts? Answers, just take it away if anyone wants to discuss. I don't think it's B or D because it can be used in civil cases also, dying declarations. So let's eliminate B. I agree with you. It can be used in civil cases and homicides. It cannot be used in criminal cases besides homicide. So I, I agree with eliminating B. Anyone think it's B? I eliminate. All right, cool. Any other thoughts? I don't think it's a dying declaration. Why not? Because it's not made at the time of the accident. It's made like a few days later. So I think it's A, it's hearsay. Okay. Couple people thinking A? That's my, that's my opinion. We yeah. don't. I think A too. Um, also because he called the nurse two days after the accident. It's not like right away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's and it, what's trying to be admitted is the affidavit, which was the doctor's affidavit, not the statement to the nurse herself, if I'm understanding the question correctly. So it's like two different things. Does anyone consider D? I mean, is there any truth to the statement that D is making? I mean, I, I think that it's the judge, the one that has to wait, not wait, but, you know, decide this or consider it because the rules doesn't apply at some times in the proceedings, but I'm not sure. So I thought it was A. But is D, would D be the question to, I mean, would D be the answer to the question that is being asked or is D answering something else? Because I feel like D is answering something else, not the actual question. I don't know. That's when I I think my this, understanding, um, I, it's thro throwing me off because I don't think it has to do with the question or with the question. But I'm wondering if is if I read the question wrong. Reading comprehension, my issue too. Um, I have everyone thinking it's A so far. Anyone disagree? Wait, Andrew. Could it be D because they're ruling on the admissibility? Talk to me. I mean, that's kind of what I'm thinking. All right, we have some D coming in. But the judge decides admiss if it's hearsay or not, so the judge can consider. Mm -hmm. He can consider any statement, but then he could say if it's allowed into the jury or not. I'm, I'm kind of with you. Um, so no one thinks it's C. Though here say the statement of then existing mental condition. Right. 
Did anyone listen to Mark and get convinced on the other way, or we like A because we think it's hearsay? No one has any thoughts? Can I, I mean, it's evidence, it's tough. I never like to get the first one wrong. My gut was D, actually. My gut here was D, but do you guys feel strongly as A? No, I don't besides think Besides so. gut, besides gut feeling, can we like legally address, like can we like rule yeah, my, address it? Like, I mean, my argument is exactly what Mark said, is that questions of admissibility are for the judge and the weight of the evidence is for the jury. This is a question of admissibility mm -hmm. and the judge may consider hearsay when it comes to evidence of admissibility, when it comes to, you know, considering admissibility. So that's why I, D struck me, but then I saw A, 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 and I kind of wanted to hear everyone's opinions. What about M? You were the first one to put A. Are you still on that? I mean, D is interesting, but I think I'm going to go, I'm going to go with A. I, like I think that. I'm, I think I'm switching it to D also just because rereading the call of the question, it's asking on the admissibility it's like the admissibility of, On the, of consideration. the statement. Yeah. Yeah. So we're switching to D a lot of people. I would click D. And if we get this one wrong, we start off 0 for 1. It's fine. We're going to do 50 questions today. We'll get a lot of them right. But I would And then next D. week you're saying it's <laughs> Yeah, the answer is D. Good job, Mark. Thank you for kind of reaffirming what I was thinking because as an instructor when all the students say A it's hard for me to like see if I'm right or not Mark thank you for that I mean to be fair look I did this question in December I should have known it more concretely but good start Mark I'll give you that and uh and Joe I like D thanks for for that the judge may consider the affidavit and making its determination and admissibility of the pedestrian statements even though it's hearsay so good job Mark standing strong in that statement that questions of admissibility are for the judge the weight of that evidence is for the jury and because this affidavit was for the admissibility it was for the judge and the judge may consider anything including hearsay extended explanation um even though the affidavit is considered hearsay the rule for preliminary admissibility terminations allows the court to consider hearsay therefore the judge may come may properly consider the affidavit we're good. And so, and it's not its then existing state of mind because it happened two days, he was sharing that two days afterwards. Yeah, exactly. It, it happened later. So it's not, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter if it's hearsay, if it's exemptions, exceptions, whatever. It could be anything because it was strictly whether or not something was admissible and whether or not something is admissible is a question for the judge. And the judge is allowed to consider even hearsay statements. So whether or not it, it was an exception or exemption or it was hearsay, doesn't even matter the answer is definitely d um we're good with that one it wasn't asking whether it should come in right i think that's what i was confused on usually it's like if it'll come in and the answer is usually no but it's because it was ruling on the admissibility exactly okay entertaining it may the judge consider may the court slash judge consider it yes because none of this hearsay stuff in matters right okay. it would be like if it was in a if we were a grand jury it'd be like okay it might be a, this or that, but it's a grand jury. None of that matters. Here we're saying, is it admissible or not? The judge can consider anything. Good start. Um, at least we got a green. At least we saw green. Okay, but let's move on to the next one. Uh, I'll read this one too, and then I'll read the first couple, and then I'll pass it to someone. Is the neighbor's testimony about the woman's statement admissible? A pedestrian sued a defendant for injuries he suffered after the defendant allegedly drove his car through a red light and struck the pedestrian in a crosswalk. At trial, a woman who had seen the accident testified that she clearly saw the defendant run the red light and hit the pedestrian. The defendant did not cross-examine the woman, and she was excused as a witness and immediately left the jurisdiction. The defendant then called the woman's neighbor to testify that the woman had told him a week after the accident that the defendant had not run the red light. The pedestrian objects to the neighbor's testimony about the woman's statement. Is the neighbor's testimony about the woman's statement admissible? And you could all take a minute to reread it as I read the answers. Yes, both to prove that the defendant did not run the red light and to impeach the woman. Yes, only to prove that the defendant did not run the red light. Yes, only to impeach the woman with their prior inconsistent statement. No, because the statement is hearsay if offered to prove that the defendant did not run the red light and cannot be offered to impeach 
because the woman was not given an opportunity to explain or deny the statement. We have a D, strong D, weak D, medium D, sorry, <laughs> never mind. Um, any other answers? We have more Ds, a lot of Ds, a C, okay. Anyone have any justification for their answer or just like answers? I say C because um, after doing in messing up on so many evidence questions, I do realize that there's a pattern that if there is a conflicting statement, then usually it's only to impeach the person. Um, I don't think it's D because when you impeach somebody, you don't need somebody, you don't need to have the opportunity to explain or deny the statement. I don't think that's relevant. Um, anyone who picked D have a thought or reasoning, rationale? Well, I think that the person didn't chose not to cross-examine, you know, like it lost the opportunity. So now they want to bring someone else to say a statement of another person, an out of court statement. I don't know if I explain myself. Mm, decent. Anyone else have any reason for D? We're just kind of picking answers out of the hat here. Anyone who didn't speak up have any questions or, or thoughts? Maybe like it would be helpful for me. I would have just like kind of try to eliminate them and then try to land on D. So we're saying that he can't, it can't be offered to prove that he didn't run the red light because it is being offered to prove the truth of the matter that he's did not run the red light. Right. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't fit within any of the exceptions for that. So we're eliminating A and B. Right. And then, so now we're just left with C and D. I'm with you. If you're eliminating A, A is a mix of both B and C. So, or if you're eliminating both parts of A, then you're eliminating A, B, and C. That's not necessarily true. Is there an argument to be made that they gave up their opportunity to cross-examine and therefore they lost the right to uh, to exclude her? That's so, what I'm saying. That's what Grace is saying. That's what Grace yeah. is but wouldn't that allow it to come in then because they lost that right? Like you can't just be like, oh, I waived that. By the way, you can't bring in a conflicting statement. From what I understand, the party that lost the opportunity to cross-examine, mm -hmm. now it wants to, you know, touch that same um, matter. Yeah. I, okay, so now I'm saying C. You know, what Grace is saying is has merit that we think that it should be C or D. We think that we should only be able to bring this in to impeach them. And usually we can impeach them. But here, you had the opportunity to impeach them on cross-exam, and you didn't. And then the witness immediately left the jurisdiction. So now they don't have an opportunity to explain or deny the statement. That That's what... what brings weight to D. Is that why May, Joe, Pablo, is that why you guys were leading D? Yes, I believe that, <clears throat> you know, for me, the reason that, I, you know, the, the woman left the uh, yeah. addiction, that's going to make it, you know, be the best option. And when we eliminated A and B, is the percent that D is, is the right one because of this increased to the 75% that I'm for sure is gonna be the right one. Okay. Anyone else have any reasons for D, Joe or uh, May? Or M, you, you like C, but you're not really sure? Yeah, um, D sounds okay. I just, kind of like Sam was saying, C, I feel like that usually is the right answer for these kind of questions. I don't know if it really matters that that person's not there anymore. It's still a conflicting statement with what she said. Mm -hmm. so. I'm, I'm leaning D. Uh, Mark, you have an opinion? Yeah, I think it, I think it's D. 
Good job, Mark. I love that. Oh, look, more people pick C than D. That was a tough one. I'll just be honest with and uh, Catherine, you for you visiting. Not all questions on the NBA are this hard. Those were two very, very difficult questions. Um, our first question of the day this morning was like, if someone falls off a ladder, it was like super easy. These ones are hard. Okay. The woman's out of court statement is hearsay of offered a proof of the defendant. We knew that. It can't be that they ran the red light. The question we were having is about the impeachment. Further, because the woman did not have the opportunity to explain or deny the earlier inconsistent statement at trial, extrinsic evidence may not be offered to impeach her. Uh, C is incorrect. Let's see, look, she's an answer that I picked in the past. C is incorrect. Extrinsic evidence of the woman's prior inconsistent statement may not be offered to impeach her because she was not given an opportunity at trial to explain or deny the earlier statement. So we all know now um, that if you're going to impeach someone, you'd have to do it on cross-exam. And then if they immediately leave the jurisdiction, you kind of waive that opportunity. Are we cool with that one? Tough one, super tough one. Um, all right, I'll try reading this one. Should the court allow the plaintiff to ask the defendant about the destruction of the report? A plaintiff sued an individual defendant for injury suffered in a collision between the plaintiff's car and the defendant's truck while the defendant's employee was driving the truck. The plaintiff sought discovery of any action report the employee might have made to the defendant, but the defendant responded that no such report existed. Before trial, the defendant moved to preclude the plaintiff from asking the defendant in the presence of the jury whether he had destroyed such a report because the defendant would then invoke his privilege against self-incrimination. Should the court allow the plaintiff to ask the defendant about the destruction of the report? No, because a report that was prepared in anticipation of litigation is not subject to discovery. No, because no inference may properly be drawn from invocation of a legitimate privilege. No, because a party in a civil action may not invoke the privilege against self-incrimination. Yes, because the defendant's destruction of the report would serve as the basis of an inverse of an inference adverse to the defendant. Again, tough questions at the gate. Does that count? No. Oh, I was gonna say, can anybody remind me if is C a possible answer at all? That's one thing I can't remember is if you can use that privilege in um, civil. I don't like C. You can invoke the fifth. You can. Invoke you can invoke it, but yeah, you. I think you can invoke it in a civil action, but I don't think it's the appropriate answer, like Andrew said. Yeah, you okay, can. Okay, so you can't invoke. Yeah. Okay. This says you may not invoke the privilege. That's not true. You can invoke it in civil or criminal. I was just making sure that's what I thought too, but I just wanted to make sure I had that real break. All right. It's raining D's. Uh, any confidence in these D's? Anyone want to explain why they think it's D? Um, <clears throat> well, they think. I think it's A, but I. I think it I don't know if I'm understanding that this report was made it because... wasn't prepared in anticipation of litigation it was just like it's well at least in my opinion sorry I'm not gonna fully say it wasn't made <laughs> um just because it's like it to me the accident report seems to be more of a like typical like um business like record than something that's being prepared or but but I think suit. they may they made the record just in case there's litigation. I that that's what I'm thinking, so that's why I'm choosing A. But I might be wrong. Okay. Um why does anyone think it's D? This is why I hate these questions. I guess I was thinking that the point that they were trying to make is that um, because she because they know that he would have pled fifth anyway, so what would the benefit be for them to ask the question anyway? So I think that's why I understand T. Because if he doesn't I want to answer that question, that can show yeah. like why he wouldn't want to answer the question because he know he destroyed. I think like the destruction of the report is like you're trying to hide something and 
if you're trying to hide something, then that means that there's something negative to hide. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe, yeah. maybe like it's not like maybe just like one step at a time. Like with a like it's okay because sometimes it, uh, reports prepared in anticipation of litigation is actually subject to discovery. Sometimes, um, I think there's like a work product exception and things like that. Um, and then maybe for B, no, because there's no inf no inference may properly be drawn from the invocation of illegitimate privilege. Um, I, I don't know about, I don't know. So is that right though, to think of that for A? I, I kind of agree with you with, with A, why I don't love A. A report that was prepared in anticipation of litigation is not subject to discovery, but there is no report, right? An action report that might have been made to the defendant, right? But if it was made to the defendant, what, what's the evidence here that would have been made in anticipation of litigation? Even if there was an action report, it seems like that action report would have just been made in the ordinary course of business so i think it would be discoverable if it was if there was an accident report it would be discoverable but there's not even an accident report so right. I don't have a. um b because no inference may properly be drawn from invocation of a legitimate privilege i don't love that answer either no one likes that answer I mean, if, if someone says that, like, I'm invoking my privilege, you know, against self-incrimination, someone may think that, oh, he's responsible for doing this because, look, he doesn't want to testify. So I don't, I don't know about that one. Yeah, I'm leaning D. Anyone disagree? Okay. All right. Good job, pass. D is correct. It is proper to draw an adverse inference from a civil party's invocation of privilege against self-incrimination as well as to presume that when a party destroys evidence, such evidence would have been detrimental to the party's case. Therefore, the question is proper regardless of how the defendant responds. Mm. We had A is incorrect. Even though the work product immunity may apply to a report prepared in anticipation of litigation, a party may not destroy evidence and subsequently claim it was protected. The party must first bring the matter to court for a ruling. In this case, the plaintiff is not seeking to show any report to the jury, but rather to simply ask whether the report had been destroyed. Uh, in civil cases, proper drawn adverse inference or assertion of privilege against self-incrimination. Furthermore, a party's destruction of evidence would be proper grounds for a jury to presume that the destroyed evidence was adverse to that party's case. Here, the court should allow the question to be asked because it's proper regardless of how the defendant responds. All right, good stuff, everyone. Um, I, I, I had this whole speech about how short evidence questions are now. They're longer than ever. All right, um, let's see. Alita, do you mind reading this question? Sure. After hearing the officer's testimony, what standard should the court use in determining whether the items have been properly authenticated? A defendant has been charged with being a felon in possession of a firearm. He has maintained that he was only an overnight guest in the apartment in which the firearm was recovered. At trial, the prosecution seeks to offer various items of evidence found at the apartment, including mail addressed to the defendant at that apartment, various receipts bearing the defendant's credit card information, and clothing of a size that would fit the defendant. The prosecution wishes to use the testimony of the law enforcement officer who found the items in the apartment during a search to authenticate them. And so again, after hearing the officer's testimony, what standard should the court use in determining whether the items have been properly authenticated? A, whether the prosecution has made a clear and convincing showing that the items are what the prosecution claims to be. B, whether there is sufficient evidence to establish a chain of custody of the items. C, whether there is sufficient evidence to support a finding that the items are what the prosecution claims them to be and D is cut off. Um, D, whether by a preponderance of the evidence, the items in question are what the prosecution claims them to be. I need to quietly reread before I can answer. No worries. Looks like we have a C and a D. Yes, here, um, Andrew, so uh, in my, my case, um, it's between C and D for sure. But I believe it's C because it's, um, you know, um, the evidence is that, that 
you know about these items, the prosecution has to claim that it is uh, belong of here and is sufficient evidence in, in, in this case. Um, is so they, ha they have to they have to prove that. That's why I believe C is the best option for for this question. Do you have a rebuttal, Grace? I have not really. I just think that I did a question related to this and that I wrote on my notes that the standard for this, it was preponderance of the evidence, but I could be wrong. Um, any, when I said that we have C's from Mark and Joe, any C's, any D's, any A's, any B's? I feel like confidently it's not A. I feel confidently it's not D because I think that's the wrong standard. I think that's when like the defendants or attorney is trying to bring it in. It's not the prosecution. Um, I like C also. I like because C. My gut was C. I know Lita doesn't like my gut, but. <laughs> I, it's not that I don't like your gut. It's just because I, you know, there, I, I did, wise so that we can properly it, learn it. It explained what my gut was thinking in the first question. You did, which is why I'm, you know, it's not your gut. It's just, you know, your gut doesn't help me. <laughs> Same thing here. That sufficient evidence is the standard. And I like it over chain of custody because I don't think chain of custody is proving enough. I think we have to prove they are what they want them to be. And then preponderance of the evidence, yeah, that seems more of like, like Em was saying, a standard for, you know, uh, proof of an element of the of the case. I would go see, based on my gut. Okay, let's see, my gut was well worded. This is a correct standard for authentication under FRE 901 is whether there's sufficient evidence to support a finding that the evidence is what the proponent here claims it to be. Um, chain of custody is one way of authenticating the evidence, but it's not necessary here since the prosecution has called a witness who will testify that I saw each of them. So if he saw them, he has to have sufficient evidence to support a finding. D is incorrect. The FRE requires proof sufficient to find according that the items are what the prosecution should be requiring a court to find by the higher preponderance of the evidence standard that the items are what the prosecution claims they would be would result in keep relevant evidence from the jury. Okay, tough question. Um, let's see. Uh, Grace, do you mind reading this one? I can do it. Um, should this statement be admitted? A plaintiff sued a letter manufacturer for injuries he suffered to his neck and back when he wronged of the ladder on which he was standing when a wrong, sorry, wrong of the ladder on which he was standing gave away. When the plaintiff's back and neck continued to be very sore more than two weeks after his fall, his treating physician had sent him to an orthopedist for an evaluation. Though the orthopedist did not treat the plaintiff, he diagnosed an acute cervical strain. At trial, the plaintiff has called the orthopedist to testify that in response to the orthopedist's inquiry about how the plaintiff had injured his back, the plaintiff had told him, I was standing near the top of a 15 foot ladder when I abruptly fell, landing hard on my back after which the ladders toppled onto my neck. Should the statement be admitted? Uh, yes, because the plaintiff is present is present and can be cross-examined about it just because it was made for the purpose of medical diagnosis or treatment. No, because it was not made for a treat, treating, sorry, no, because it was not made to a treating physician and no, because it releases to the, relates to the inception of the cause of the injury rather than the plaintiff's physical condition. I think it's the... Why everyone's saying B, I say D, and everyone. It was made for a purpose of medical diagnosis because the orthopedist said what happened. So it was in, he doesn't have to be a um, treating physician. And um, I think it's just, it satisfies it as long as, as long as it is through the, made for the purpose of medical diagnosis or treatment. Anyone disagree with B as in basketball?
I think it's A is in applesauce. C is in caterpillar. D is in dominoes. Um, that's I like what Sam was saying. It doesn't have to be to the treating physician. It was for the purpose of medical diagnosis. Was it for the purpose of medical diagnosis? Sam to an evaluation. He said, I was standing, yeah, he told him what happened. But it was to the inception of the cause of the injury rather than the plaintiff's physical condition. But see, he's saying like, he, he diagnosed, you have an acute cervical strain, but how, you know, how it happened, it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You already have the diagnosis. That's what I think. That's how I understand it. No, because he, when he was in trial, it was when he was called to testify, he asked, he was asked how he came to that answer. And he yeah. came to that answer by asking him that. That's how he diagnosed him. You might be overthinking it, Grace, because it just seems to me what everyone else is saying, that it's just a statement for the purpose of medical diagnosis or treatment. But it could be wrong. Grace, you have been, I like, I like people who stand their ground. That's one of my favorite characteristics. But it's not always the best move. Sometimes you want to go with the, with the group. Okay, so B is correct. No, I stand my ground. <laughs> the plaintiff's statement fits within Rule 803.4 of the Federal Rules of Evidence. See, Matt would have known that. As this statement made for purposes of medical diagnosis. This rule allows not only statements made to treat physicians, but also statements made to other doctors for evaluation or diagnosis, including doctors consulted for diagnoses for purposes of litigation. Here, right, including doctors consulted for diagnoses for purposes of litigation. Here, the statement was made in response to a question by a treating orthopedist and was made to explain how the plaintiff's injuries occurred. D is incorrect. The information that the plaintiff related to the doctor, although it does relate to the cause of the injury, was pertinent to diagnosis or treatment and hence is admissible under 8034 of the FRE. Are you satisfied, Grace? Content? No. no? Not really. All right. <laughs> Can't get no satisfaction, right? Anyone know who sings that? Did you just refer to Benny Benassi? Satisfaction? Do you say can't get no satisfaction as the stones? Yeah, um, well, I'm not referring to a Nazi by any means. I have no idea who that is. I'm sorry if I should. I just heard satisfaction. You don't, you don't remember that sign? Satisfaction. Satisfaction. Yeah, I didn't understand the, what you said. I didn't understand. I thought what she understood. No, I was talking about rolling. Um, you know what I had there. All right, um, Pablo, you mind reading this one? Yes. Um, <clears throat> a plaintiff has sued a defendant alleging that she was run over by a speeding car driving by the defendant. The plaintiff was unconscious after her injury and accompanied by her husband, was brought to the hospital in the ambulance. At the trial, the plaintiff told the emergency room physician to testify that when the physician asked the plaintiff's husband, if he knew what happened, what had happened, the husband, who was upset, replied, "I saw my wife get run over two hours ago by the driver, who went right through the intersection without looking." Is the physician's testimony about the husband's statement admissible? Okay, no, because it's related to an opinion. No, because it's very, not with any exception. Yes, and a semi made for the purpose of diagnosis or screening. Yes, as an exciting ultimate. <clears throat> so, here, I guess this uh, B is going to be the, is going to be for me the, the answer. I'm not against B. I don't hate huh? B. I don't hate B. I like B. You like it's, B? It seemed, you said B is in basketball, right? Yes. I kind of, a process of elimination, right? Does it seem like it was made for purposes of diagnosis or treatment? And it wasn't that person. It was that person's husband. So I don't really like A or no, no, Hold on. Let me see. I was going to say, I always learn that... Um, the exception for the medical or purposes for treatment or whatever it's exception has been put in mainly because they know that people when they're getting treated they're not going to lie because exactly. they want good treatment 
So that's why I think it's it's B because it was the husband, and I think it's directly between the the patient and the doctor. It seems like hearsay to me. Any any anyone else think it's hearsay? Grace M, Mark, Nico. Well, what's the what's the rule statement though for the excited utterance? Like, why why not this one? So so. I think it's because it happened two hours. He was he said that it happened two hours ago, and it's not. I think unless I'm confusing it with present sense impression, isn't it that you have? It's like as it's happening. Yeah, that the the statement as it as it's happening. Right, that doesn't seem like an excited utterance. The is like, oh my god, he shot me, or like, holy something. Like that's just kind of like two hours ago. That I don't think it's excited utterance. I don't think it's a medical diagnosis. I don't think this is a good answer to this question, right? Just because it relates to an opinion doesn't make something admissible or not, or make something inadmissible or not. I think it's one of the hardest answers to pick on the test, but actually is a very common answer on the test, right? Anyone saving us from picking the wrong answer? We're going with hearsay. I liked excited utterance because it says he was upset. I don't know if that I think makes... it's good. I think it, I think I like I I don't know who said it, but I think excited utterance does have to happen like right in the moment of when it occurs. Like if it was like if he was like, oh, I saw my wife. I just saw my wife get run over by a driver. I think that's how it would be excited utterance. But because they like left the scene and everything, I don't think it could be excited utterance. I agree. We're going to try hearsay. The password to class today. It is here, say the password to class today. The physician's testimony contains an out of court statement made by the husband as being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. What happened in the accident, including who was at fault. This statement is not for purposes of medical diagnosis or treatment, but to establish liability. Moreover, it was made two hours after the accident and therefore is not an excited utterance because the excitement of the event has likely passed. Um, I think that's what we were saying. Okay. Um, C, the rule governing the hearsay exception for statements made for purposes of diagnosis or treatment requires that the statement about the cause of the injury to be reasonably pertinent, which typically does not include statements assigning fault or identifying a perpetrator. Here, the husband's statement that makes the accusation of fault for the accident was not pertinent to the diagnosis or treatment of plaintiff, exactly what Sam said. And then D, as explained above for the statement to be admissible as excited utterance, the declarant must have been under a continuous state of excitement between the time of the event and the time of the statement. Here before the, you hit next, can you before you hit next, can you show the question again? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. I was I just wasn't I wanted to reread the statement that the husband had said specifically because okay. I don't know if I had just like I saw missed the part where he was assigning the fault or identifying the perpetrator. Like I I, I hadn't really put those two I, together. I saw my wife get run over by a driver. That's when I when we read out loud, I was like, this sounds like hearsay. This sounds like if the, if we could just bring in statements like this every time you're in a taxi cab with your wife, you'd be like, "Ooh, now's my moment to say." You know, would it have been? Would it have been not hearsay? Like, had he just said, like, for purposes of diagnosis, like, if the doctor asked uh, what happened, and he would have just ended his statement with, "She just got, she just, she was run over." Would it have been allowed? Would it have been allowed then if it was made by the husband, even because the wife wasn't conscious? If it was made for the purposes of medical diagnosis, I believe so, yeah, it would be admissible. But here it was to establish uh, the Yeah, when he said by a driver who went yeah. through the intersection, that's what makes it the fault part. Yeah. Um, all right, here we go, nice and short. Uh, M, do you mind reading this one? Sure. Um, a defendant is on trial for knowing possession of a stolen television. The defendant claims that the television was a gift from a friend who has disappeared. The defendant seeks to testify that he was present when her friend, when the friend told her neighbor that the television had been given to the friend by her mother. Is the de defendant's testimony about the friend's statement to the neighbor admissible? A, no, because the friend's statement is hearsay, not with any exception. 
B, no, because the defendant has not presented evidence of circumstances that clearly corroborate the statement. C, yes, as non-hearsay evidence of the defendant's belief that the friend owned the television. And D, yes, under the hearsay exception for statements affecting an interest in property. We have some C's. It's a tough question. I know I've encountered this one before, something similar to it. I say C because I think it goes with like his state of mind. Like if he truly believed that it was like uh, not stolen, then the statement from the friend when he was present there would have given him that impression. And I don't think that he's offering it to prove that it's actually from the mother. I think he's offering it as hearsay, like to prove the truth of the matter that it asserts, hey, this is a gift from the mother. I think he's offering it for something else like what she just said. I agree. I think it's one C. And you know, I students who have worked with me like uh, Grace since October, I told her straight up, evidence was my weakest subject. And now it's become a strength of mine, you know, just you'll see I get questions. I've gotten questions wrong in the past. I would have gotten this question wrong months ago, but now I kind of understand exactly that it's not being brought in to prove the truth of the matter asserted. It's being brought in to prove the belief that the friend owned the television. The friend's statement is exempted as non-hearsay because it's being offered to show that the defendant believed or had knowledge that the friend rightfully owned the television, which is relevant to whether the defendant knowingly has possession of a stolen television. The statement itself, that the television was a gift from the friend's mother, need not be true, but rather it is being used only to show the effect on the defendant or the listener. Um, the extended explanation, out-of-court statements offered to show the effect on the listener. That's exactly what we said. We did a great job including attributing knowledge or belief or not hearsay. Here, the defendant is offering the friend's statement as evidence that the defendant thought the friend owned the television that had not been stolen. Because the defendant is charged with knowing possession of a stolen television, his state of mind is relevant. If the defendant had heard the friend say that the television was hers, that evidence would be relevant to the defendant's state of mind, regardless of the truth of the statement. Therefore, the friend's out-of-court statement is not hearsay. Really good job. Can, we see, can I say the question again quickly, please? Of course. Because it's a stolen television and we're trying to see if he had that belief that he owned the television we're not bringing in for the truth of the matter that's asserted that um you know that he stole it or not but just as non-hearsay evidence of the belief that he owned the television okay got it it's tough hearsay is the toughest thing on one of the toughest things on the exam but definitely practice tons of evidence questions um uh, by the way, Sabrina, do you mind reading this question? Yeah, I got it. A man has sued a police officer alleging that the officer violated the man's civil rights by using excessive force while arresting him. At trial, the officer admits having hit the man in the head with the butt of his gun, but contends that the force was necessary because the man was resisting arrest. In support of his contention, the officer seeks to introduce evidence that the man had arrest, had resisted arrest on three prior occasions during the last 10 years. Is this testimony regarding the man's conduct during the three prior arrests admissible? Can you read the answers too, please? Oh, yeah, sorry. A, no, because evidence of the prior incidents constitutes impermissible character evidence. B, no, because the officer has not shown that the man was convicted in connection with the prior incidents. C, yes, because the incidents in question are relevant evidence of the man's propensity for violence. D, yes, because the incidents in questions are sufficient to constitute a habit. Yeah, a couple of A's. Triple A's. Mm. Four A's. It seems impermissible, right? Because you're just trying to say because you did it three times, you must have done it this time. It's not enough to constitute a habit, right? It's insufficient to be a habit. Also, I don't think you need a conviction. 
mm-hmm. referring in fire incidents like this, so I don't think it's B. Yeah, I think they're throwing the 10 years there to trick you. Propensity yeah. evidence isn't allowed either, I don't think. Yeah, I like A. This is a civil case where the use of prior conduct at three arrests is not permissible as evidence that the actor likely acted in accord with those past actions. So we know in civil cases, um, it's uh, character evidence is impermissible and it's only gonna be permissible in criminal cases if they've opened the door first and then the specific bad acts, maybe that could be like a mimic thing, but not to prove conformity. I think we're good on that one. Um, oh, I like this question. Can, uh, Nico, you mind reading this one? Sorry, yeah. Um, a famous author had a life insurance policy with an insurance company. Her son was the beneficiary. The author disappeared from a residence in a major city two years ago and has not been seen since. On the day that the author disappeared, a plane which took off from the only airport in the city where the author lived disappeared while flying over the ocean. The plane's passenger list included a passenger with the same first name as the author, but a different last name. The son is now suing the insurance company for the proceeds of his mother's policy. At trial, the son offers to testify that his mother told him that she planned to write her next novel under a pen name. The pen name she chose is the same name that appeared on the plane's passenger list. The son's testimony is, A, admissible as circumstantial evidence that the author was on the plane. B, admissible as a party admission because the author and her son are in privity with each other. C, inadmissible because the author has not been missing more than seven years. D, inadmissible because it is hearsay, not within any exception. Um, I, I, I want to say that it's D because I just don't think any of the other ones fit, but that's a guess at this point. It's just trying to choose the best option. I'd say D. What did you say? I'm saying D is in dog. D is in dog? Yeah. Two Ds. Any other thoughts? Hmm. Not C. Okay. Process of elimination. A or D. A or D. Okay. D. A. Any other thoughts? Anyone have any confidence in their answer? These are all kind of guesses. Sam with the A. Sam, usually when you pick an answer, you have thought reasoning. I picked A because um, I guess in my head I was thinking, I don't think it's hearsay because it wasn't like a statement. He was trying to prove that she yeah, was that- and it's relevant. So I say A. I agree with Sam with respect to like, is the statement that's being said, like, is it being offered for the proof of the matter asserted? Like, is it really for the truth of the matter asserted? Not for the proof, for the truth of the matter asserted? Right. I mean, isn't it? Well, what I'm thinking is that if you're asking for a life insurance, if the beneficiary only gets it if the person is dead. So they don't know if the person is actually dead even if it disappeared and even if you have the pen name. So that's why I think it's D, as in dog. I kind of think that what you said is why I think it's A as in dog. They're not trying to prove that he was dead or not. They're trying to prove that he was on the plane. Yeah, I think A is relevant. I think it's A. A is in? Apple. Apple. A is in, are the dolphins winning or does anyone know the score again? It's they on lost. commercial. No, they lost. It's over. Are you serious? 34-31. Oh, no. See, look, I'm being honest. When I did my course this morning, they were getting crushed. 17-0. When I took a break, they took the lead. They came with the most epic comeback. 
And then since I've been doing my course, they gave up the lead and lost. It's like definitely something that worries me about next week and my other favorite thing. All right. They really tried. Yeah, good job, Dolphins. They didn't have two, man. It's all good. We'll stay positive. Okay. The Sun's testimony concerning, this is a tough question, so let me look back to it. So the Plains passenger list included a passenger with the same first name as the author, but different last name. So there's a different name. The Sun's testimony concerning his mother's statement that she planned to write her next novel under the pen name, which appeared on the pa Plains passenger list, is not hearsay and is admissible as circumstantial evidence that the author was on the plane. Although it's an out-of-court statement, the statement is not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted that she planned to write her next novel under the pen name. Instead, the statement is being offered to show that the person under the pen name was in fact the author. Since the statement is not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted, is admissible as relevant evidence? That's a tough one. And you can see, like, I got this question wrong a month ago, and now I've got it right back to back days. Like, that it, when you have a weakness in a, in a subject and you want to get better at it, it's just practice, practice, practice. I'm living proof that you can turn weaknesses into strengths. Okay. Um, let's see and the only reason i had to turn this into a strength for me is because i knew that jeremy or uh letty wasn't going to teach it so i was like if i'm going to teach the subject i need to get really good and i've put in the work and that it's it's possible anything is possible um okay how about uh sam do you mind reading this question okay sure um uh, a defendant is charged with mail fraud. At trial, the defendant has not taken the witness stand, but he has called a witness who has testified that the defendant has a reputation for honesty. On cross-examination, the prosecutor seeks to ask the witness, didn't you hear that two years ago the defendant was arrested for embezzlement? Should the court permit the question? A, no, because the defendant has not testified and therefore has not put his character at issue. B, no, because the incident was an arrest, not a conviction. C, yes, because it seeks to impeach the credibility of the witness. And D, yes, because the earlier arrest of a crime of dishonesty makes the defendant's guilt of the mail fraud more likely. Didn't you hear that two years ago the defendant was arrested for embezzlement? C, Grace? Okay. I say C, too. C, C, C? Like, D is bad. We hate D. D is just not what evidence is about. We'll go with C as in Caterpillar. Good job, everyone. C is correct. The witness has testified that she knows about the defendant's reputation for honesty, which opened the door. The prosecutor then has the right to test the basis and adequacy of that knowledge, as well as the nature of the community itself through inquiry into specific action and cross-exam. Good job, everyone. Um, okay, let's see. Joe, do you mind reading this one? Yep. <clears throat> a defendant is on trial for extorting $10,000 from a victim. At issue is the identification of the person who made a telephone call to the victim. The victim is prepared to testify that the caller had a distinctive accent, like the defendant's, but that he cannot positively identify the voice as the defendant's. The victim recorded the call, but has not brought the tape to court, although its existence is known to the defendant. The victim's testimony is A, inadmissible because the victim cannot sufficiently identify the caller, B, inadmissible because the tape recording of the conversation is the best evidence. C, admissible because the defendant waived the best evidence rule by failing to subpoena the tape. Or D, admissible because the victim's lack of certainty goes to the weight to be given to the victim's testimony, not its, to its admissibility. Any thoughts? Very impressive. I don't think the contents of the tape are at issue, so I don't, I don't think this is a best evidence rule thing. I think she's just talking about the voice and whether she can like identify it or not, and I think that's more of a jury issue. So maybe D. I disagree. I think it is a best evidence issue because it is the contents. It's if the person is the if the person who's on the calls the defendant 
then mm-hmm. that's that makes the, the telephone call relevant to the to like to the case or not. You know what I'm saying? You know, so like, just like, can you say it one more time? Sorry. I'm saying like, I think it has to do with the telephone call because it's mm-hmm. better to, I mean, if it's the defendant on the call, mm-hmm. then the telephone call is relevant or not. But if it's not the defendant, then it doesn't matter. So it has to do with the best evidence. You can't just take the, uh, the victim's word for it at this point. You have to find another way to identify it, which the best way would be to have the tape recording since it exists. I follow I, that. I agree that the, I agree with what Mark is saying, but I still think it's D because they are only asking about if it's admissible or not um, and not whether he shows the right evidence to present, you know? Yeah, usually it's not the best evidence rule as an answer from what I'm from what I know. It's usually one of the trick answers and then it's not it's the victim's testimony that's the one being asked about whether it's permissible like not whether the tape recording or not is what is like the tape recording itself isn't the issue. Yeah, I also think it's D because I think um it's not an issue like whether like you believe that like when you're deciding admissibility it has nothing to do like whether you think that like the victim is like like th- like you're not weighing like what the victim is saying um it's more so like can you like bring it in it has nothing to do like i think the whole um idea that um he cannot p- positively identify the voices the defendants is just like a distractor because like that does that doesn't matter and um when deciding whether it's admissible or not i'm with you i think d i Joe, think the public has spoken the public has spoken yeah although mark is usually sometimes the voice of reason the Sorry, victim, mark my bad i was wrong this time no it's okay man the the loss of the dolphins is weighing on you d is correct the victim's testimony is admissible because it's based on his personal knowledge related to identifying the defendant's voice any lack of certainty would go to the way that evidence, not the admissibility itself. The best evidence rule does not preclude witness testimony, and the victim is not attempting to introduce the tape into evidence. Um, <laughs> the best evidence rule requires a production of the original when the contents of recording are being introduced into evidence, which is not the case here. The victim is seeking to testify to his knowledge of the caller's voice, not introducing the recording into evidence. So you see, they say, um, The brought, not brought the tape to court. There's no evidence that they're. Oh, sorry, that they're bringing it the says tape. like at issue is the identification of the person who made the telephone call. I think that's like the main thing, exactly. and it's not not the content of of the tape, but the identification of the voice. Yeah, exactly, Lita. Thank you. All right. Let's see. Um. Uh, Claudia, do you mind reading this one? Um, okay. A passenger is suing a defendant for injuries suffered in a crash of a small plane, alleging that the defendant had owned the plane and negligently failed to have it properly maintained. The defendant has asserted in defense that he never owned the plane or had any responsibilities to maintain it. At trial, the passenger calls a witness to testify that the witness, uh, that the witness had sold to the defendant a liability insurance policy on the plane. The testimony of the witness is uh, yeah, I think I'm with D on that one. Can you read the answers to the question? Oh, you want me to? Okay. Inadmissible because the policy itself is required under the original document rule. Inadmissible because the rule against proof of insurance where insurance is not itself at issue. C, admissible to show that the defendant had little motivation to invest money in the maintenance of the airplane, admissible as some evidence of the defendant's ownership of or responsibility for the airplane. And you like D because we are like, ownership. Yeah, to show yeah. insurance by ownership. So, um, the witness's testimony that he had sold liability insurance on the plane 
to the defendant is admissible evidence to show the defense ownership or responsibility for the plane. It is relevant because the defendant has denied ownership. So we're going to bring it in for ownership or control. Um, Mark, do you mind reading this one? Is the jail employee's testimony admissible? A defendant is on trial for kidnapping. The victim has testified that one of the kidnappers refers referred to the others as speed. The prosecutor calls a jail employee to testify that while the defendant was in jail awaiting trial, other inmates address the defendant's speed. A, no, because it is hearsay not within an exception. B, no, because it is sub substantially more prejudicial than probative. C, yes, if circumstantial evidence that the defendant was the one was one of the kidnappers. D, yes, to corroborate the truthfulness of the victim. I'm getting with a lot of confidence. C's. Why do we hear like C? Identity. Mm -hmm. Identity. See it then, yeah. Good job. Identity. Um, the jail employee's testimony is not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted, but that the kidnapper and the defendant have the same nickname. The evidence is admissible as circumstantial evidence of identification. So in the question they say, or in the answer, as circumstantial evidence that was one of the kidnappers, that's what that means, identification. Good job. Everyone's doing really good. Um, I want to have Catherine, if you don't mind reading this question. Yeah, sure. Okay. In the Okay, so on the issue of the expert's qualifications, the letter may be considered by, and then it says, in the prosecution of a defendant for forgery, the defense objects to the testimony of a government expert on the ground of inadequate qualifications. The government seeks to introduce a letter from the expert's former criminology professor stating that the expert is generally acknowledged in his field as well as qualified. So A says the jury without regard to the hearsay rule, B the judge without regard to the hearsay rule, C neither the judge nor the jury because it is hearsay not within any exception, D both the judge and the jury because the letter is not offered for a hearsay purpose. So without helping or people, no one put any answers in the chat, please. This was actually the first question of the day, right? When Mark and I held our ground, what did we say? Questions of admissibility, and Catherine, if you don't remember, it's okay, but I'll try. Are questions of admissibility for the judge or the jury? And you can guess, because it's a 50% chance. It's, it's the judge. Uh, you heard the word. <laughs> Thanks for ruining her big moment, but yes, for the judge. My bad. It's all good, man. I know it's you're right. So, okay, but now, all right, please don't, no funny interrupt, please. So, Kathy, so if questions of admissibility are for the judge, not the jury, can the judge, um, must, the, must the judge regard the hearsay rule? So, must he regard it, yes, or may he disregard it, no? So, regard it, yes, or disregard it, no? Um, may regard it. He doesn't need to, right? Doesn't need to. Doesn't need to without regard. So the judge without regard to the hearsay rule. Right. That's the way that we would go about doing this question, right? When it comes to admissibility, it's going to be a question for the judge and the judge is not have to pay any mind to hearsay. Awesome. I think law school would be a perfect career path for you. You seem set for this. The court is to determine preliminary questions of admissibility, including the qualifications of an expert witness, and may do so without regard to the rules of hearsay. Everyone go with that one? All right. Um, and I know, Catherine, if you said you had to jump off, you're, you don't have to stay, but I appreciate you coming to join us and tell all your friends and family about IBIS prep and the legal work we do. Um, let's see who I think Claudio, do you mind reading this one? Okay. Uh, a cyclist sued a defendant corporation for injury sustained. Which, oh, let me read the call the question first for you. Um, why is the cyclist testimony relating relating what the defendant's employee said at the hospital admissible to prove negligence? 
A cyclist sued a defendant corporation for injuries sustained when she was hit by a truck owned by the defendant and driven by its employee who was making deliveries for the defendant. The day after the accident, the employee visited the cyclist in the hospital and said, I'm sorry for what I did. At trial, the employee has testified um, that he exercised due care. It is a prior inconsistent statement. It is a statement against interest. It is a statement by a party opponent's agents. And it is a statement of a then existing state of mind. Um, statement against interest is unavailability, so B's out. A's not inconsistent statement. I think it's C. I like that. You, you went kind of quickly over that, but you said statement against interest, it can't be. And why is that? Because he's not unavailable. Right, because he's still here. Yeah. So party of uh, opponent. Party opponent's agent, C. Yeah. C is in Caterpillar. Well done. And Pablo, you weren't here this morning, but that was one of the things that we really discussed. And, you know, that's why I think there's value to everything that we do. But we really discussed this morning the difference between a statement against interest and a party opponent mission. And the statement against interest, the avail they must be unavailable. The party opponent mission, they're going to be in court. And that's the reason why, you know, we're bringing it in, because now you can, you know, explain or deny it. Okay. Um, I think everyone had a chance to read a question, right? Anyone not? We can go back around the room. I'll read this one. The officer, the office manager's testimony that the invoices show 10 deliveries is blank. A corporation sued a defendant for 10 fuel oil deliveries not paid for. The defendant denied that deliveries were made. At trial, the corporation calls its office manager to testify that the corporation's employees always record each delivery in duplicate give one copy to the customer and place the other copy in the corporation's files, that he, the office manager, is the custodian of those files and that his examination of the files before coming to court revealed that 10 deliveries were made. The office manager's testimony that the invoices show 10 deliveries is admissible because it's based on regularly kept business records, admissible because the office manager's firsthand knowledge of the contents of the records, inadmissible because the records must be produced in order to prove their contents, Inadmissible because the records are self-serving. And by, okay. A lot of A's. Anyone have any differing opinions? Or anyone why A? It's a business record made like all the time, which is why it's A. Yes, the facts say that uh, the corporation's employee always record each delivery and keeps copies. No one thinks B is a potential. I'm, I'm liking B because it's not it's not like an out of court statement, I guess. So it's like she's testifying and he has first hand knowledge of it. Mm -hmm. So they are not trying to bring the document itself. That's not trying to bring a statement, or I guess that's the contents of it. Now I'm thinking at C. Why not C? That is a good point. Why aren't they bringing the documents themselves? Well, he has first uh, hand knowledge, but yeah. Test. Um, I, maybe C. Maybe C, actually. Yeah. I was thinking B, but. B and A I think of, it's C. I think C, as a matter of fact. I think this is one of the times we're going to have to bring it in, because why not? Like, I can't think of a reason why we're not bringing it in. They haven't shown any reason why it's, why we can't bring it in. And aren't they trying to bring it in for the contents of it? Yeah, yeah. the issue is precisely that once denied, the delivery never happened, and this other person says it did, so. I think I'm learning to see. I may have, you know, maybe learning from months of doing this. I am. See, 19% of people got that right, including me for the first time in history, right? <laughs> so that's the learning process. But now I understand it, that this was the best evidence rule, the original be produced, because only upon a showing of unavailability would secondary testimonial evidence be admissible to prove the contents of the records. 
Really tough question, everyone. Really tough question, but now we understand what it is. A is incorrect. Although the records themselves may be admissible under this exception, the office manager's testimony regarding the content of the records is inadmissible. B is incorrect. This may be the basis for authenticating the records, but the testimony of the records context is inadmissible under the best evidence rule. So A and B, that's why I kind of like knew to arrive at C. I was like, both of them could be the case. But C is really the best answer because although the business records themselves would be admissible under 8036, the manager's oral testimony about the records would only be admissible in the event the records themselves were shown to be unavailable pursuant to the best evidence rule. Since they're available and since we're trying to talk about the contents of them, we're going to actually have to bring them in. I agree with what Alita said earlier. It's not a common answer, the best evidence rule, and that we have to bring in the document. But this is one of the scenarios that it would be. And that's the reason why 20% of people have gotten it right, right? It's a tough question, but that's just a good way. Like, don't be like, don't be quick to choose that they have to produce a document. Make sure you do the analysis. Are they bringing it in for the contents and have they not proven or shown why it would be otherwise unavailable? Then we actually do have to bring it in. All right, let's go back around the room. Bright, any mind reading? Can you go back to that one after, Andrew, so I can read the question? Yeah. I, again, all the all the questions up to I'll put in the drive, but we'll try to go back to that one for sure. Um, yeah. Right. Did you step out for a second? I think I, you might have. No, I, this is my first question. Oh, you never read one. Yeah. Well, now's your time. Can you read a this one? A plaintiff sued an industrial facility in her neighborhood for injuries to her health caused by air pollution. At trial, the plaintiff was asked questions on direct examination about the days in which she had observed large amounts of dust in the air and how long the condition had lasted. The plaintiff testified that she could not remember the specific times, but that she had maintained a diary in which she had accurately recorded this information on a daily basis. When her attorney sought to refresh her recollection with the, her diary, she still could not remember. The plaintiff's attorney seeks to have the information in the diary admitted at trial is the information admissible hmm. did we do this one this morning yeah we did this this morning does anyone remember what the answer is yes i remember i got it right <laughs> so so why, why is it so what is the answer what do you think it is Brian? Well, exactly hey yeah Brian, you weren't here this morning what do you think the answer is only people who weren't here this morning pablo and brighton can participate <laughs> All right, Pablo, what do you think? <laughs> uh, yes, uh, uh, he, I was in the morning, let me tell you. I believe it's C, uh, because in the relating to the evidence, the plan is it should be able to 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 ask, you know, for for this um for this proof. Um for sure it's gonna be admissible. Um I choose between C and D. So this is not the best option for me. I've always related to the to the um, to the best cut. I guess it's gonna be C. And what do you think, Brighton? Did he convince you, or do you feel otherwise? I mean, <laughs> I mean, she. I think it can be read to them, but I don't know if it's gonna be admitted. So it says. Yes, and the plaintiff should be allowed the option to read it into evidence or having the diary received as an exhibit. I don't, or, or yes, and the plaintiff should be allowed to read the diary into evidence. Well, it's not being offered by the opponent, right? I think it's just being offered by the plaintiff. So I don't know if they're going to be able to receive it as an exhibit. So maybe it's just D. We like D. What do you think it is, Grace? Sorry, I was having trouble. Um, it, I, it's D. D as in Dagestan. Yeah. I agree. And we did this one this morning and it was tough. Even our master of service, Matt, had trouble with this one. The information in the diary is admissible as a past recollection recorded because the plaintiff made a record based on firsthand knowledge when the matter was fresh in her memory, which accurately reflected her knowledge and she has insufficient recollection at trial. C is incorrect. A recorded recollection may be read into evidence but it may not be offered as an exhibit unless offered by the adverse party, which is exactly what Brighton was saying. So, can I, I can I say something of how I learned this rule? Of 
think about that if they all, um, give the whole diary to the jury, they will have the opportunity to read the information they said on trial plus other information. So you always want to keep um, narrow, keep it narrow. Exactly. If they put in the whole diary, then yeah, they would see about the crush that I had on Tammy or Minna, you know what I'm saying? Like they would see too much. Right, okay. Um, ooh, dog trained to detect heroin. Sounds like a dog. I don't know, dogs should probably be trained to detect anything. So why don't, uh, Brighton, back to back, you didn't get to read, you, you ended and begin. why don't you read this one? Sure, no problem. So a defendant is charged with possession of heroin. The prosecution's witness, an experienced dog trainer, testified that he was in the airport with a dog trained to detect heroin. As the defendant approached, the dog immediately became alert, pawed and barked frantically at the defendant's briefcase. The defendant managed to run outside and throw his briefcase into the river, from which it could not be recovered. After the witness's experience is established, he is asked to testify as an expert that the dog's reaction told him the defendant's briefcase contained heroin. The witness's testimony is, so after the witness, so he's a, okay, so he's experienced. So I guess they're saying he's an expert, right? He's asked to testify as an expert that the dog's reaction told him. So the witness testimony is, admissible as evidence of the defendant's guilt, maybe. Admissible because an expert may rely on hearsay. I don't, it doesn't seem like there's any hearsay issue here. Exactly, it's, it's a dog, it's not a human. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, inadmissible because it is based on hearsay, not with an exception. I don't think, yeah, it, I don't, I don't like C and D. It's, I think it's admissible. As an applesauce? A as an applesauce. Anyone out there agree? Yeah. Disagree, please. A as in Josh Allen. You mentioned the, that this morning that dogs and something else didn't Machines. apply to hearsay. Machines. Much. Yeah. A as in Josh Allen. Ooh, that was untimely. <laughs> A as in Josh Allen. A is correct. The dog's behavior of drawing attention to the defendant's briefcase was not hearsay and is admissible as evidence of the defendant's guilt. Hearsay is an adequate statement that is being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. A statement is either an oral written assertion or nonverbal conduct of a person if it is intended by the person as an assertion. Because the dog is not a person, its reactions to the defendant briefcase do not amount to a statement. Who with this? All right. Uh, Pablo, do you mind reading this one? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> At the defendant trial of gang related murder, the prosecution introduced a former testimony that a statement by gang member who testified against the defendant at the preliminary hearing and has now invoked his privilege against the self incrimination. If the defendant now seeks to impeach the credibility of the gang member, which is the following is the court most likely to admit. A. Evidence that the gang member had three misdemeanor convictions for assault. The testimony, test, testimony by Psychology, psychology that the person with the gang member background have tendency to fabricate. Testimony by witness that at the time the gang member testified, the gang member was challenging the defendant leadership role in the gang. And testimony by witness that the gang member is a cocaine cocaine dealer. Um, <clears throat> um, here, the best option for me, I believe, is C. C is in uh, yes, and cat. Yeah, I agree too because it's a bias. Exactly, yes. leader. Excellent. We're showing bias here. C okay. is correct. This is evidence of bias. It shows that the okay. defendant had a motive to implicate the defendant falsely because by doing so, he would remove the defendant from the position that he wanted to have. Evidence of bias, and in my outline this morning, I said common answer named E, is considered important and generally speaking is liberally admitted. Know that the gang member can be impeached even though he is not a trial to testify. Federal Rule of Evidence, FRE 806, allows party to impeach a hearsay declarant in the same ways that would be permitted if the declarant were to testify. This is because a hearsay declarant is essentially a witness in the case. Awesome. Um, 
Let's see. Em, do you mind reading this one? Sure. Um, a defendant is on trial for arson. In its case in chief, the prosecution offers evidence that the defendant had secretly obtained duplicate insurance from two companies on the property that burned and that the defendant had threatened to kill his ex-wife if she testified for the prosecution. The court should admit the evidence of A, the defendant's obtaining duplicate insurance only, B, the defendant's threatening to kill his ex-wife only, C, both the defendant's obtaining duplicate insurance and threatening to kill his ex-wife, or D, neither the defendant's obtaining duplicate insurance nor threatening to kill his ex-wife. This guy sounds like regular Prince Charming. So Alita says A. Alita, quick off the hip. Why were we bringing the insurance? I said that this morning, right? Um, it's not the the insurance would be getting brought in to show that he has like a reason to have committed the arson, not because he has the insurance itself or the other reason why it might be brought in. Why not? See, yeah, here for me, um, the option is uh, A because you know, so the defender is on trial for arson, yes, and the option that I've, he obtained the duplicate insurance is like one of the reasons that I've, you know, is, is why the defendant uh, is now in the trial because of this, it's not because of the the it's threat to kill the wife is irrelevant i also think yeah i think the, i think the threatening to kill his wife ex-wife there might be um like you might say that it, it there's too much of a pre prejudicial effect if you bring it in um and like i don't think there's much probative value of like as far as like discussing like because he's on trial for arson so i don't think it necessarily the relevancy connects. Yeah, Sam has a good point. I'll be honest. My gut was leaning with what Sam was saying. But but isn't I mean, like him threatening his wife is like isn't evidence of like guilt, like you know what I'm saying? Like consciousness of guilt. Uh, I don't know. Is it a collateral matter? Uh, the killing of, her, of his wife? So I don't think it should be admissible. Yeah, I think. Is it admissible as a collateral matter? Is it admissible as motive to create to create arson? Is it? I don't think I mean, it has anything to do with arson. Like, I would. I, I I hear you. I don't think it has anything to do with arson either. But as I'm talking, I'm thinking like, yeah, but isn't it admissible anyway? Just because it's like, I don't know. Could be like you said, a collateral matter, just something different. Oh, what is it being offered for? Like. Oh, I guess you could say, I guess you could argue that it's being, like, you could argue, like, it could be admissed, like, as evidence of guilt, because, like, he's, mm -hmm. like, because she's about to say that he committed the arson. Yeah, but that's, the facts are not stating anything about that, so that would Agreed be... Agreed with Claudia. That would be yes. just, our minds are running right now. I'm with you. Um, I haven't heard from two of my favorite... Uh, supporters M or Mark, I'm with you guys between A and C. I'm with C. I'm with, I'm C. with C also. I'm with C also. Okay, I can't truly articulate why, but I just feel like the threat to kill the ex-wife is coming in, and I know that's not going to sit well with Alita. Can anyone articulate why the threat to kill his ex-wife should come in? I, I think now maybe I'm getting like convinced because it's relevant evidence, but it, like. I think it has like some probative value, but it doesn't like. I don't right. know. See, that's what I would articulate. It seems relevant, and it, there doesn't seem like a reason why it shouldn't come in, right? Yeah. Like, it's not hearsay. It's 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 not being a being brought in to prove that it was arson. Uh, it just seems like it's showing some messed up stuff. I guess I would say that the it he he tried. Okay, why would you threaten to kill somebody? If they testified against you, if you weren't guilty, yeah, some sort of consciousness of guilt or motive or something. I don't know. Go see. We could get one wrong. This is this one we're split on, but my gut says C. All right, not good or bad, just is what it is. 
Both the defendant obtained duplicate insurance and a threat to kill his ex-wife if she testifies are relevant and admissible under 404B for purposes other than bad character show conformity therewith. The duplicate insurance is relevant in establishing the defense motive for committing arson. The threat to kill the ex-wife is relevant as to his plan, knowledge, or as Brighton said, consciousness of guilt. That was really what it came down to. We tried, we like danced around it. I wasn't strongly confident in it, but it was a consciousness of guilt. Consciousness of guilt. Um, The issue here is where the piece of evidence can come in. Um, mimic, right? Evidence of other crimes is generally not admissible to prove conformity, but it could be for other purposes. Mimic. The fact that he attained duplicate insurance is for the committing arson. Um, the threat to kill the ex-wife if she testifies is also relevant and admissible because it establishes the defendant's plan and knowledge and his consciousness of guilt. The highly probative nature, someone said that, of this evidence is not substantially outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice. Both obtaining duplicate insurance and threatening kills ex-wife are therefore admissible. So really, that was a case of like, yeah, the, the the threat by the ex-wife was easier to bring in. It was the the duplicate insurance that actually had to like be an exception. But there was no reason not to bring the threat of the against the ex-wife. That was just um, probative information. Uh, Aaliyah, you mind reading this one? Uh, sure. Should the wife be required to testify? A defendant has pleaded not guilty to a federal bank robbery charge. The principal issue at trial is the identity of the robber. The prosecutor has called the defendant's wife to testify to the clothing that the defendant wore as he left their house on the day the bank was robbed, expecting her description to match that of the eyewitnesses to the robbery. Both the defendant and his wife have objected to her testifying against the defendant. Should the wife be required to testify? A, no, because the defendant has a privilege to prevent his wife from testifying against him in a criminal case. B, no, because the wife has a privilege not to testify against her husband in a criminal case. Yes, uh, because the spousal testimonial privilege does not apply in criminal cases. And D, yes, because the wife's viewing of the defendant's clothing was not a confidential communication. We definitely talked about this this morning. Did you press D on purpose? No, 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 I didn't. My bad. <laughs> we talked about this this morning. I'm not clicking anything. Nothing has been clicked. I just can't unclick. It's we D. Like, we like B as in basketball, right? This privilege is you can't impose it on someone else. I can't prevent my wife, husband, or non-binary spouse from, from uh, testifying, but I can say I'm not going to testify against my husband or wife. Like I can invoke it upon myself. So that's what B is saying. We all like be here? Awesome. We're doing really, really amazing. Is is there, but there are there situations where you get to it to prevent them from no. testifying? I mean, yes. Like we said, if, if you can prove that they're cuckoo or something, but not under the spousal testimonial privilege, right? That's a specific privilege. And you can't use that privilege to prevent someone from testifying. There might be other ways of impeaching your wife, but you can't like automatically have a privilege to prevent them. That automatic privilege is like, uh, it's not even doctor patient. Doctor patient is not a federal one. It would be like psychotherapist and slash social worker and patient. It would be like, uh, uh, with the one we just said right there. Um, and so this is the one for the spousal privilege and then is there there's also marital communication right but this one but it's more the marital MBA. communication and, and testimonial marital communications is between the communications between the husband and the wife that mm -hmm. survives the marriage and even death this mm -hmm. one is only for the duration of the marriage and it's only that you can invoke it and not testify against your husband or wife another one is like a clergy you know clergymen have a privilege usually but the, the federal privileges are the ones that we mostly talked about this morning. Um, okay, uh, Pablo, do you mind reading this one? You're on mute. Do you hear me now? Yes. Yes. A plaintiff sued the defendant for wrongful death erasing out of traffic collision between the plaintiff defendant and the defendant. At trial, the investigating police officer authenticated a tape recording of her, of her receipt, dictation, and comment using the preparing the writing report of her factual findings. He has testified that the tape recording was accurate when made and the 
currently has no clear memory of the detail of the investigation. Is the tape recording admissible, admissible as evidence? Yes, under the recorded collection exception to the Hershey rule. Yes, under the public record exception to the Hershey rule. No, because it's arrested and the police report being offering against the defendant in a wrongful death case. No, because the police report itself is the best evidence. Um, here <clears throat> is between A and B, yes, and it's A. Yeah, yes, somebody answered that, yes. Right, because you knew it was accurate when you made it, and now you have no recollection of it. Therefore, under the um, recorded recollection exception, that would be the best answer. Yeah. All right. Um, Nico, do you mind reading this one? Sure. Um, at a defendant's trial for sale of drugs, the government called a witness to testify, but the witness refused to answer any questions about the defendant and was held in contempt of court. The government then calls the police officer to testify that when the witness was arrested for possession of drugs and offered leniency, if he would identify the source, the witness had named the defendant as the source. The testimony offered concerning the witness's identification of the defendant is A, admissible as a prior consistent statement by a witness. B, admissible as identification of the defendant by a witness after having perceived him. C, an admissible because it's hearsay, with, not within any exception. And D, an admissible because the witness was not confronted with the statement while on the stand. Um, A. We have an A and a D. We have an A and a C. An a I think it's B as in boy. B, this is the first time where someone has guessed every question. I always wondered if that would ever happen. I always wondered if there was a question where every answer would be viable. And here it is. Okay, so we have A, B, C, and D. Oh no, we I just have think... C and D. No one, has, no one guessed A. Sorry. You said B though, Grace, why B? B because he was, I, I am reading it as if, he, as if he was there. He has personal knowledge of the identification. Mm -hmm. So that's my, my hey. reason. Uh, Sabrina, why do you think it's D? Um, so, I mean, it, it's coming, like, I don't, I might not say like my logic correctly because I'm still refreshing, but I think because the witness didn't testify, like it, like, I, I don't know, for some reason, I think that because the witness like was in contempt of court and they refused to answer any questions, you can't bring in someone else to say something that they said, but I could be wrong. <laughs> What I'm thinking about that, if I may, is that um, when this is a hostile witness, so now the person that is asking the questions can ask leading questions in order to have those answers. So maybe I am assuming that happened, and that's why it he the person was the witness was held in contempt of court. Yeah, that's. This is a tough, tough question. Um, so it's not A, right? Because nothing's being attacked, so we don't need to bolster anything. Mm -hmm. And I think, and we said it's not C because it's not, because because he said that this is a defendant, it's not being offered because he said it, that therefore this is what it is. Well, Alita thought, Alita, what was yeah. your argument? Um, uh, the offer, okay, so going back to the question says the government then calls a police officer to testify so we're one where the question is whether the police officer's testimony should be allowed or not about the witness's identification of the defendant so the witness like so that's like it's a statement made out of court right and what is it being offered for i guess is the other the other the the following question right so the the it's being offered to prove the um the name of the 
source, no? But that statement was made by the witness, like, and the witness never said anything, like, in court. So, which is why I didn't think it's D or, um, well, anyway, I don't know. So I, what what I, I can say, <laughs> what I can say about that is that I think that statements of I, I, you know, for identifying someone comes in, if even if it's hearsay, you know, as an as an exception. But the identification should have been made by the witness, not by the police officer. Yeah, I think this is like a double hearsay question. So like the first but, one passes the hearsay, but the second one doesn't pass the hearsay. So but I the think person it's was the, yeah, I don't know. I think because he was hearsay. there, it comes in. That's yeah, it's two people saying two separate things. So yeah, that double like, hearsay both, thing. Yeah, double. yeah. I forget, I always forget double hearsay, but still sticking with double hearsay answer C. I think this is a really tough question. Mm. Really good job. The proper testimony is an out-of-court statement being offered for the truth of the matter, sir, that the defendant was a source of the drug. Literally, exactly what Alita said. It's hearsay and does not meet the requirements of an exception to the hearsay rule. Um, Let me see, yeah. yeah. The police officer's testimony regarding the witness's statement naming the defendant as a source is being offered for the truth of the matter asserted, that the defendant was a source of the drugs. Therefore, the defendant is hearsay and does not fall with any applicable exception to the hearsay rule. Alita, you could have taught this question. You literally nailed it, that this is an out-of-court statement being brought in to say who was the person who was selling the drugs. Simple. Back in the beginning, you asked, back in the, like, our first class or something, you asked what was your favorite subject, and I think one of my favorite subjects was evidence. <laughs> Even though I needed a refresh, like, I've been needing a refresher on it because I was doing really shitty on it, but... You're doing good. You're doing really so good. I like it could better you, than Tori. Could you scroll up real quick? Just one second. To the to the question number. Thank you. Oh, Eleven seventy four. All right. Um. Let's see. No, excuse me. That's way too long. No, I'm just kidding. Um, M, do you mind reading this one? Sure. A defendant was charged with murder and a witness testified for the prosecution. On a cross-examination of the witness, the defendant seeks to elicit an admission that the witness was also charged with the same murder and that the prosecution told her, if he testify against the defendant, we will drop the charges against you after the conclusion of the defendant's trial. The evidence about the prosecutor's promise is A, admissible as proper impeachment of the witness, B, admissible as an admission by an agent of a party opponent, C, inadmissible because the law encourages plea bargaining. D, inadmissible because the evidence is hearsay, not with any exception. Yeah, a lot of A's come in the room, but then Alita dropping the C. I, I see that argument for, for C. I mean, I'm just thinking that he has a motive to yeah, testify. Nice. Yeah. Where is it? I don't think it's C because I don't think this is a, that's not a P bargain. That's like <laughs> exoneration low key. I wouldn't think that would be a P bargain. I think it is A. If you testify against a defendant, we will drop the charge against you after the conclusion of the defendant's trial. It's not like her statements being used as like hearsay. So I don't know. Why isn't so we automatically got rid of B though? You don't got rid of anything. Okay. I think it shows bias on the witness's side, the plea, like to, to do yeah, this. Yeah, bias. Yeah, I think it's to show motive that there's a bias. Hey, 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 hey. I need more convincing. Um, wait, as proper impeachment of the witness, the, who's the witness? The witness um, was charged with the same murder and the prosecutor told the witness, the defendant is trying to get the prosecutor to admit that they almost took a deal. And we don't like, and we, we like C because that is a true statement. The law does encourage plea bargaining, but I don't know if it necessarily encourages plea bargaining 
It's not trying to be proof of the matter asserted, the truth of the matter asserted. It's yeah. Evidence, it's not the defendant. We like A, huh? I think I've been convinced. Everyone likes A? Aaliyah, you're holding strong in C? Um, I mean, I could be wrong. I haven't. I haven't, reviewed, I haven't reviewed the subject on my own in, in like forever. No, no, I'm just saying, like, you could have convinced me back with C because I C struck. I, me. I, I just remember that exception where you know where they give where you're able to, I mean, do plea bargaining, and if you accept it, then you know, so that that the the plea bargain cannot be used in court like the that you engage that you were that you engaged in that plea bargaining that you not only that you engaged but that you took it because you can i think you can say it like if you i think you can say it if you just engaged in it but like in like there was conversations of maybe possibly having a plea bargain but didn't take it but if you took the plea bargain i think that that's when it's not allowed to come in i mean i i don't know i could be um, wrong i think what elite is talking about i think where the difference here is is because it this has to do with like the witness i don't know if what i said just made sense i think that rule kind of applies if it if it was like if you were using the plea bargaining with like in regards to like um a plea bargain being offered to like the defendant yeah Ooh, joe coming in with the c what do you think joe yeah, I agree with everything Alita said, basically. I don't think it's admissible because I think plea bargaining, like settlements, aren't allowed in. Now is the gatekeeper, because my first, when I first saw this, I, I C was what struck me, but then I wanted to be convinced of A. And I do hear what you guys were all saying, that this is proper impeachment because it does show some bias. But I do like what Alita is saying, and now Joe's confirming it. Has anyone switched teams? Or are all A's sticking with A and all C's are sticking with C? And it's just going to be up to me to decide. I think that C rings a bell because it is a true statement that the law encourages plea bargaining, you know, for speedy and all of that. But I think it doesn't apply in the context of the question. Yes, um, I'm a, uh, I believe uh, A is the best option is because the prosecution is going to be able to to say what he said to the witness is because of this, uh, in order to proper impeach as a witness, you know, so it's, it's the evidence that has to be admissible. It's in my opinion that that one, A, is still the, the best option, A as an apple. But, but what, is, what is trying to be impeached before we actually, come, what is actually being impeached? The fact that the but, statement brought to court is, it, there's a reason, there's a motive for the, the witness to say, yeah, um, this person d did this um, yeah. uh, murder, you know, there's a motive because now he's going to come to become free, you know, he's not going to even be prosecuted. All right, now my favorite thing to do. Mark, what are you leaning towards? I'm leaning towards A. All right, let's see. This has worked for me in the past. This has been 100% rate. Good job, Mike. I can always count on you. Awesome. Gotcha, that was a tough one. Although plea agreements are encouraged, they plea offers by the prosecution can be used against a witness when they provide a motive for the witness to lie. Evidence of a bias or motive to lie is not hearsay and is admissible for impeachment purposes, which includes a prosecutor's promise to drop criminal charges against a witness, thus establishing a motive to provide testimony that is preferential to the prosecution. Very, very, very tough question. See, I picked C one time in my history too. Um, it is true that plea bargaining is encouraged for purposes of judicial efficiency in the criminal legal system. However, plea officers, pre, plea offers by the prosecution may nevertheless be used against a witness to establish a motive to lie or bias for impeachment purposes. Prior plea bargaining is only inadmissible against the same defendant who the, was the party to the bargaining. That's exactly what Sabrina was saying that this was a witness. It wasn't the same defendant who was the party of the bargaining. Um, a is correct. It's admissible as impeachment to show bias or motive. The prosecutor's statement to the witness is not hearsay. It's not being offered to truth the matter asserted that the state will drop the charge against the witness. Rather, it's being offered to show the witness's bias and interest in the case having a certain outcome. 
If the witness believes that the state will drop the charge against him, he clearly has a motive to give testimony that will curry favor with the state, which supports the finding of bias from motive to lie. Therefore, he can be properly impeached with the prom prosecutor's promise to him. So the takeaway from this question is this is true. The law does encourage plea bargaining, but if we're going to bring it in to show um, bias or motive, then for a witness, it is admissible. You cool with that, Lita? Tell 100, 100. I definitely did not remember or even know if I ever learned that portion of it. And I'm not mad at you because that's what I was thinking originally too. Like, okay, is this a plea bargain? But it was to show motive or bias. All right. Um, let's see. Joe, do you mind reading this one? Yeah. <clears throat> Which one of the following is the least likely to be admissible during the prosecution's rebuttal? A defendant is on trial for the brutal murder of a victim. The defendant's first witness testified that, in her opinion, the defendant is a peaceful and nonviolent person. The prosecution does not cross-examine the witness, who is then excused from further attendance. Is it A, testimony by the witness's former employer that the witness submitted a series of false expense vouchers two years ago? B, testimony by a police officer that the defendant has a long-standing reputation in the community as having a violent temper? C, testimony by a neighbor that the witness has a long-standing reputation in the community as an untruthful person? Or D, testimony by the defendant's former cellmate that he overheard the witness offer to provide favorable testimony if the defendant would pay her $5,000. I'm going to reread this silently. Take your, take your time. Another tough question. I can help with this one. I think A is extrinsic evidence, which you can't do once the... Oh, my Lord. I just realized, and this is a life lesson, it's the least likely to be admissible. Yeah. I, I was looking at which one's the most. I was like, why would you pick A? But okay, least likely to be admissible. Go ahead, Emily. Or M, why is this least likely? Yeah, because it's, it's extrinsic evidence to bring that in. Um, and the witness rested, so you can't bring it in if it's extrinsic. And that's what they're doing with this one. Everything yeah, else? the, the uh, prosecution had to cross-examine in order to have that information, not bring another person's drink sink evidence. Yeah, I like what you guys are saying. I picked A, but also just since we're talking about extrinsic evidence and whatever, why not D also, like if that's kind of like hearsay. Mm -hmm. Good and question. It's also being like, it's also, well, I don't know. Just I, I wondering think, why I not think, D. I think D is okay. You know, I think D is, is okay to be admissible because it's showing that this cellmate is about to testify that this witness has a reason to fabricate or lie or testify favorably. He, so, I mean, to testify favorably. So he has a motive to testify favorably. So that's like why I think it's okay that I would come in making it A. But yeah. that would show that there's a motive to testify. Right. Right. So like, so testimony by the defendant's former cellmate that he overheard the witness, this witness, uh, this that the witness offered to provide, wait, sorry, testimony by the defendant's former cellmate that he offered the witness that, well, I can't even read right now. So the testimony by the defendant's former cellmate that he off, that he overheard the witness offer to provide favorable testimony if the defendant would pay her five thousand dollars i think that like that shows that you know you you it calls into question like like their 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 bias or their motive mm -hmm. uh, but i think that if i think it's, you, it's murder so this is a if this is a criminal case so you need to um, confrontation clause. So right. if the person is not there, you, no. it's a strength, you know, you need, you, the person needs to be able to explain his statements, his statements in, during cross. Yeah, I think it is A. I think it is A. I was just saying. Yeah, I agree with A. I think it has like nothing to do with uh, what's being like charged. And then the other ones have like, admissible because of like impeaching and stuff like that and then yeah i think d because yeah the bias as well i like it good job everyone 
The testimony is inadmissible because there's extrinsic evidence attacking the winner's character for truthfulness, which is not permitted, right? But we can, after the defendant present evidence of non-violent character, the prosecution may rebut that testimony with other testimony as to the defendant's reputation in the community for having a violent temper. A witness's credibility for truthfulness may be attacked or supported by evidence in the form of opinion or reputation testimony. D is incorrect. Evidence of prior bad acts may be admissible through extrinsic evidence if it's offered for a purpose other than a propensity to commit a crime, exactly what Bray was saying, such as a witness's bias or motive to lie. Hey, can we see the extended though for just, just, just for A, that's the why? The applicable rule is that specific instances of the conduct of a witness for the purpose of attacking or supporting the witness's character for truthfulness may not be proven by extrinsic evidence. Testimony from a former employer that the witness submit a false expense report is extrinsic evidence that is being sought to be admitted to attack the witness character for truthfulness and is thus inadmissible. Pretty much exactly what we were saying. We did a really good job as a class. But on cross though, that's that the prosecution should have just asked that witness on cross, hey, have you heard of this instead of bringing in another witness, right? Is that it? Exactly why, because they, they should have asked him on cross, but they rested and then they didn't cross him. And now we're trying to bring it on rebuttal. It's too late to do that. All right, so we did 25 questions. Let's review all the ones that we got wrong, um, which are none of them. We got 25 out of 25. And do you remember which one was you wanted to see? No. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll check it out, but everyone that's an amazing session. Um, we'll take a 10 minute break, come back at 611 and we'll come back and do some more questions. When we come back, can we do a few of the long ones? Cause I know sometimes like the longer ones on like practice exams, like mess me up. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>